Okay, welcome back to the NeuroFX Learning Collaborative um, to our uh, session on brain implants and neuro, um, neurotechnology. Our lecturer tonight is Professor Ken Foster. Ken is a professor in the bioengineering department at Penn. Um, he has, uh, for most of his career, um, been extremely involved in the uh, social and ethical side of engineering. Um, he's past president of the Society for the Social Implications of Technology, of technology. is that right? Yes. And um, as we were just reminiscing, the first time I ever talked to Ken, I, I called him up and I apparently had his cell phone number and he told me he was um, you know, up to his knees and elbows in, uh, let's well just say, water unclean water um, uh, in uh, Mississippi um, uh, with a group of Penn students um, leading a group of students in engineering as well as other fields uh, to try to um, assess and uh, address pollution in, uh, in the wake of Katrina. Anyway, um, uh, Ken's uh, main research within engineering is on the biological effects of electromagnetic radiation, but as, uh, as part of his interest in the social and ethical dimension of engineering, he has recognized that neuroengineering has a lot of uh, grist for his mill and um, he's gonna uh, give us a, a tour of some of the major issues. Thank you, Ken. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I should point out, I'm not a neuroscientist, although I've done a lot of reading and, and some writing in this field. Um, my main interest all along has been in sort of the social impacts of technology, which of course neuroscience and neuroengineering has quite a bit. Um, Martha, in our discussions, um, gave me this incredibly broad topic. I think I was supposed to cover um, brain implants and e everything else that sends signals out of the head, and the other speaker was to talk about everything that you can do with by sending signals into the head. Um, I tried to narrow it down, and what I'd like to, well, first of all, um, I just got back about half an hour ago driving down from Montreal this morning. I'm about nine hours on the, on the New York State Thruway and other highways. Um, I was thinking quite a bit about brains in a jar sitting in this um, small car with my wife driving along and me composing some of my slides and she driving and this is the brain computer interface. Um, what I'd like to do is give a um, instant overview um, of a couple uh, technologies which one of which is very well established, another which is, is just coming on stream now. In fact, maybe several years from being widely used. And the third being a rather sensational um, demonstration that was uh, published a few years ago uh, about the control of animals using planted electrodes. I think these are all sort of standard technologies that most neuroscientists have read, but uh, I like to sort of, um, after I give you this instant description of the technology, sort of describe how these have been presented to the public and some of the issues that have been raised, um, which are either classical neuroethics, bioethics issues, or issues that relate to the impact of technology in society, or simply the communication of technology uh, and science to the public. So uh, first, I want to give you uh, basically a 10 second or maybe a 10 minute description of these technologies. Um, the first two uh, involve the use of implants to help assist people with pr profound, um, I, I don't want to use the term disabilities because as we'll see that's a ra rather um, sensitive term, but people who have uh, impaired um, hearing or, or vision using um, a device that stimulates parts of, of the brain <coughs> and, and as you can see, both of these technologies have, are taking off dramat dramatically. Um, cochlear implants got started in the 60s, and the number of papers that are published every year is still increasing. We're now talking about something like 400 scientific articles a year in the peer-reviewed scientific literature on cochlear implants. <coughs> Retinal implants got started in the late 80s and 90s, and they're just starting to take off now. But these are clearly going to be very major um, technologies. Um, the first <coughs> cochlear implants um, 
were used with humans uh, back in the 50s. Several groups in the United States and Europe implanted uh, humans with these things. And uh, it was, what, 30 years later, 20, 27 years later, when the first one of these implants was approved for sale in the United States by the Food and Drug Administration. And in the last decade, implants got to the point where you, they could actually be totally implanted in the, in the head, <coughs> receiving power and signals by radio frequency communication across the skin. And in the literature on this, the um, uh, investigators routinely say that this is by far the most successful of all newer engineering devices. We're now talking about a device that has almost 200,000 people implanted um, around the world probably most of them, or many of them in the United States. And there are actually three companies marketing these things in, in the United States. So this is a very, by orders of magnitude, a more widely adopted neuroscience implant than anything else. And it's highly successful, at least commercially. Interestingly enough, um, when there's a long lag time between when these things were first um, proposed and when they became very practical. And scientists, at least some scientists, have routinely expressed a tremendous amount of skepticism about whether these things would actually work until they become common day occurrences. Can I ask um, you to break my rule about no interruptions? I just yes. ask you to briefly say what a cochlear implant okay. is. Just well, in case. Okay, well, that's going to be, I'm sorry. Oh, is that coming? That's coming from next. Oh. Um, well, okay, I, I'll skip. Well, let me just, a cochlear, let me just um, skip back to this slide later. Um, cochlear implants are meant to remedy sensory neural hearing loss. Most people who uh, have hearing deficit have a problem with their middle ear and bones, stapes, and so forth don't convey sound pro appropriately to the cochlea. And these can be treated using the standard hearing aid, simply amplify the noise going to the ear. Um, for people with sensory neural hearing loss, um, they basically, basically means that, that the, the nervous um, connections between the cochlea, the transducer for the sound, and the auditory nerve are somehow defective. Usually, the hair cells in the cochlea are damaged or the um, various cells that, that neurons that connect the hair cells to the auditory nerve are, and the central nervous system are somehow damaged. Um, s for these people who are typically profoundly deaf, using a hearing aid isn't, a pr isn't any kind of remedy because the neurological, the neural wiring is, is damaged. So the cochlear implant is intended to directly stimulate the the central nervous system in a way. But actually what it does, what the implant is designed to do is to fit inside the cochlea and then provide a, a stimulus to uh, produce um, responses in, in the subject which they can perceive as sound. This is, um, okay, and it sounds like an extremely easy thing to do but it turns out to have been technology that took 30 or 40 years to become successful. And if we look at the tremendous skepticism that people have expressed over the years, back in the 60s, famous scientists were saying it simply can't be done. The idea of putting a small wire into the cochlea and stimulating the, um, the auditory nerve or the, is, is simply it was too much for them. And people kept on, famous scientists kept on saying through the 80s that this would never really work. But now, of course, the technology does work. Um, a typical, um, there are several companies that make these things. Uh, I think, believe, three companies have them on sale in the United States. Um, the systems involve several parts. Um, there is an electrode which is threaded into the um, cochlea. Um, it's um, connected to a implanted stimulator beneath the skin on the, on the scalp, which um, receives a signal from a radio frequency transmitter placed outside the head. And the, tr the 
um, signal, the sounds are picked up by a microphone, which is placed typically over the ear, a little battery pack, and there's a speech processor which encodes the, the speech into um, signals corresponding to different frequency bands in the, in the, in the, in the speech. And as you know, the cochlea is designed to be frequency selective. It's basically a long, and then here in terms of traveling wave device, uh, spiral type structure. And the sensing organ is, is a membrane that's in the center of, of the cochlea. And at the membrane tends to be sensitive to different frequencies at different places along the cochlea. So the cochlear implant uses an electrode with six or eight or ten different um, electrodes built into it to stimulate different parts of the basilar membrane to produce sensations in the subject which correspond to uh, that would be, which would be produced by tones at different frequencies. And so the, the um, speech processor basically takes the incoming sound, the voice or what have you, breaks it down to different frequency ranges and then arranges to stimulate the different parts of the cochlea to produce, again, a result which would be similar to that which um, would be experienced in a normal person with normal hearing by the, that same sound. It's clearly a very crude approximation to what actually happens in a normally functioning human, but people can learn how to recognize different voices, recognize, um, understand sentences and words and so forth. To give you some idea of how well these things work at this point, um, this is a result of a, of a study by Blake Wilson, published, actually review published just last 2008, two years ago, um, looking at the accuracy with which people with cochlear implants can understand either oral uh, spoken sentences or, or single words. These are for sentences. These people had been profoundly deaf before the implant. Afterwards, a month later, the sort of they got an average of 70% correct. And by a year or two of experience and training, these people had achieved accuracies of 80 or 90% in understanding written uh, spoken sentences, which is really quite a um, remarkable achievement. This takes a lot of work on their part, requires training on their part. Um, as well as um, um, just lots of experience. And other people have done, um, sur conducted surveys of implant uh, recipients and their um, significant others, and basically everybody is quite happy with these things. Um, the, um, the, the significant others of, of these people with implants find that it's easier for them to communicate with these people. It's less of a burden for them to have to keep on translating um, written um, oral communications into uh, sign language and so forth. And so basically, there are, at this point, there are almost no problems. People are quite happy with the technology. But this is after 30 or 40 years of, of, of experience. It's known also that this is not exactly a free ride. You can't just get an implant and then start you know, b being, being absolutely um, normal in your hearing. Uh, it takes uh, much, much training. Uh, these tend to be most successful in when they're implanted either in adults uh, who, after the point at which they learn how to use language, but less than seven years or so after the deafness occurred. The story is that the brain plasticity has reduce, reduced in time and it becomes much harder for them to adapt to these. Um, the controversial uh, aspect of the brain implants is with children. Uh, these are most successful when they're implanted in children before the age of two or four. After that, the children um, sort of lose the ability to learn to speak the language. And it, it then becomes much more difficult for them to, um, to communicate orally. And so the general um, recommendation is that if you have a child who is born deaf, 
he or she should be implanted with an implant before the age of two years. And in fact, the indications now are that uh, these children too can be implanted before the age of one year. We'll get into some of the controversy that this has uh, raised, raised with the deaf community um, later on in this talk. And again, this requires a certain amount of motivation, both from the patients and the parents. And preparing for this talk, I just heard, I just came across a fair amount of complaining from parents that their kids keep on losing the damn things. And if you're talking about a $40,000 device and the kid loses this transmitter, the parents are not very happy, as you can imagine. But that seems like fairly minor. Um, the technology, I'll get into the ethical issues later on in this talk. The technology has been evolving gradually. Um, when the cochlear implants were first introduced and first gotten approval from uh, pre market approval from the FDA, the indications were for use in postlingually deaf adults, adults who lost their hearing after having uh, <coughs> uh, learned how to speak. Um, as time went on and the technology was clearly successful in these people, the FDA uh, extended the approval to, for use in children. Uh, the earliest that I've read that these are implanted now is for a child who's nine months old. But it's very common to put these in one year old children. And there's a growing um, trend to use these with adults with some hearing to sort of improve their oral comprehension. And there's a trend now to implant these in both ears to give people a, a sense of localization, stereophonic hearing. And some of the new systems that are being developed now combine electrical stimulation of the cochlea together with acoustic stimulation. Because it turns out that many people um, who have some loss in their cochlea uh, still have parts of it functioning. And the, typically, the part of the cochlea that is, is sensitive to low frequency sounds quite often goes last. And so many people have residual hearing at the low frequencies. And so some of the newer systems that are being developed in include both electrical and acoustic stimulation. And the surgical techniques are improving. Um, the signal processing is improving. Um, the engineers are being able to cram more and more channels with different frequencies into the electrode. So you can actually get a more uh, lifelike um, stimulus to the, to the subject. Of course, for people who have extremely severe sensory neural hearing loss, even this won't work. And there is some interest um, in scientific work developing brainstem implants. But these are much harder to get going because um, you don't really know how to encode a signal to excite the brainstem in such a way that the subject experiences something that they would recognize as being, as being intelligible sound. It's fairly easy to excite different parts of the cochlea and produce the sensation of, of hearing um, because that's basically how the system works. Um, the artificial retina is is a somewhat analogous device, which is just now coming, I won't say into use, but in advanced stages of testing. These um, devices are intended to treat mostly retinitis, pigment, retinitis pigmentosa, which is a deterioration of the um, retina, which basically involves patient losing um, the, the photoreceptor cells in the retina. And so these um, devices would be put either on the outside of the retina or on the inside surface of the retina and produce electrical stimuli to um, produce some comparable, something comparable to visual sensations in the people. And again, you're putting the, um, the exciting electrode, actually electrode array, in a place where you can produce patterns of stimulation which are similar to those that would actually exper be experienced in a um, fully functioning person as they see light. As you can imagine, these are much harder uh, devices to get going than cochlear implants. There actually are three companies that are developing these things, um, and they're in some advanced stage of development, although none have received FDA approval at this point. 
Um, this is sort of a cartoon um, illustration of how these things work. You know, the camera the implant, again, could be placed either subretinally on the outside of the retina, beneath the retina, or epiretinally on the inside of the eye against the retina. Um, you're talking, uh, these things have a, a, arrays of 16, 64, or so many, up to a few hundred uh, electrodes, which then stimulate different parts of the retina. And as a um, image is produced on, the, on these things, that then um, will produce patterns of stimulation similar to that which would be produced in a fully functioning retina by, you know, by, the, same, by the same image. Um, Here's another, um, the, probably the most um, wa well-known company in the United States that's producing this is a company called Second Sight. It's now uh, 12, 13 years old. It's still in the development stage of this thing. And this shows a, a typical uh, one of their arrays, electrode arrays. And this shows the, the, um, the, what the equipment will look like, a camera, electronics, um, and a coding device and the electrode against, against the retina. I have, if you'll bear with me, a um, sample broadcast from CNN News, which just came out a few months ago. quite impressive, isn't it? The concern that I have, I don't know for sure, but I'm virtually certain that this is just a phase two trial. And so I think they put this thing in for a short time for testing, and I'm pretty sure that they're going to be taking it out fairly soon. I tried to find the protocol of this trial on the NIH website, and all I could find listed from this company, Second Sight, was a phase two trial, short-term implantation, as part of the feasibility studies for an FDA pre-market uh, approval application. Uh, I guess that one might, um, if you wanted to discuss ethical issues, I have a feeling that 
this is not conveyed accurately to the viewers of the TV. And I think that this may well raise uh, expectations and hopes probably more than would be justified at with the current status of the technology. But anyhow, the device clearly has promise. How long it will take this company to get this thing through the FDA and into the market, I'm not, I don't know. Um, in the literature, I, I see um, comments, even in fairly recent articles, saying that there are three companies that plan to release these devices before the end of 2010. Second site, whose device we saw on CNN News, and two others. Uh, and I've tried to find out with the time I had whether any of these things were even close to having FDA approval. I think no. I think these are still in phase two clinical trials. And um, it's going to be a while before these things are actually released. But consider it as devices in some advanced stage of development. I believe it's very exciting what they've accomplished. Whether the public will view these with that caveat, I just don't know. The um, devices um, are clearly extremely limited. The, the quality of the vision that people can get, I, I should probably not, I should probably be more careful in my, in my terminology. The, the sensations that people get from these uh, devices produce um, something that the person can interpret as being vision, and the quality is quite low, which is what you would expect from an electrode, which has only got 64 you know, electrodes built in. Um, so the spatial resolution and what people can perceive is very low. This covers only a small part of the retina, so the field of vision is very low. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's sufficient to allow people to orient themselves to light. And as you saw in the CNN uh, show, people could, can use this to walk along a path. And so there's at least a, a significant chance that these devices, even in this very low stage of development, comparatively speaking, could produce a significant um, assist to people who are, who are blind. The other, the third uh, technology, which is sort of interesting to talk about, is, is RoboRat. Uh, this was developed by a group at um, SUNY, I believe in Buffalo, which um, appeared in a 19, in 2002 article in Nature, and that act got a lot of attention. And I think part of the thing that interested me about this was the amount of attention that, that the, that the um, paper actually elicited. The, um, investigators, um, here is RoboRat, what they, they planted several sets of electrodes in this animal. They planted two electrodes in the um, regions of the brain that were um, processed information from the animal's whiskers. And as a rat navigates through the subway system in Philadelphia, for instance, and through tight areas, it uses its whiskers to, as cues to determine basically how much space the animal has to navigate. And so by stimulating the part of the brain that receives um, input from those whiskers, the investigators could give animals sensations which they could interpret as being directional sensations. And also the um, investigators put electrodes in the medial forebrain, which is when excited would give the animal an intense uh, sense of pleasure. And so the robo rat worked by having investigators using a little remote interface um, stimulating um, sensations which the animal would, would, would interpret as sensory, as, as directional cues. And then when the animal moved in the right direction, would zap them and the animal would feel really good. Uh, a, a kind of electronic reward. I, here is, you never can tell that stuff on, in, on YouTube, but I think this is a, le a legitimate video based upon a little bit. There's RoboRat. The
Okay, so that's RoboRap. There's one other YouTube, which I guess I won't show you now, but it, it basically, um, they're trying to sell this um, to um, sponsors, I think, as, on the, on, as possibly training rats to um, go into burning buildings, bringing small cameras and finding, you know, victims and maybe finding where explosives are in underground storage shelters in Iraq and things like this. So um, I guess one can't sell science anymore on the basis of interesting science. You have to look for burning buildings or explosives in Iraq. That's, that's some other videos. Um, the other, um, this actually cr has been cited many times and other people are picking up on this. Um, here is a um, paper which just appeared, I believe it was this year or in 2009, uh, a group in Japan has done the same thing with goldfish by <laughs> using a remote um, infrared um, data link and um, triggering um, exciting parts of the goldfish brain connected with, with swimming. Just, um, let's see if I can get this thing to work. I wonder what the pleasure center of a goldfish is like. Yeah. Anyhow. So we have three um, quite different technologies, one of which is clearly <coughs> here, another which will here be here sometime, probably not this year, maybe 10 or 20 years from now, another of which is here in a way, but it's not being put to any practical use yet. Um, it's sort of interesting, at least to me, to think of how you can look at these um, different technologies in terms of the kinds of ethical issues that, that they would um, raise. Uh, I'm actually indebted to a um, talk from Eric Roycine, is that how it's pronounced, given at Sandia about five years ago. He was actually concerned with the ethics of brain-computer interfaces, but more largely with communication about science with the public. He pointed out that um, different kinds of neurotechnologies raise different issues which really are um, sort of the classical bioethical issues, the kinds of things that people have been debating for many years about uh, drugs and what have you. And all of the technologies that I've described tonight are related essentially to brain-computer interfaces. All the fancy stimulation circuits and what have you are basically generated by computers. And the kinds of, of sample issues that he identified are reliability and safety. And of course, these are huge issues with cochlear implants and uh, retinal implants. Although it doesn't look like um, the issues are co completely un impossible to overcome. It doesn't look like there are any major safety issues with, co with cochlear implants, despite the fact that some of these have been implanted for many years. Um, issues that come up in a very striking way are the consent of the patients for implantation. I'll discuss this in a moment with respect to um, cochlear implants, and, and also um, to the possible access to the technology and what we would call distributive justice. The, as you probably know, um, the cochlear implant has been intensely controversial in the deaf community for many years. Um, it, and it um, partly arises, this controversy partly arises because scientists and doctors have had a very different view of what constitutes a disability and impairment than deaf people themselves. Um, um, and um, I think scientists have often been unaware that there's this difference in, in perception. Uh, a standard view that a, well, 
Well, first of all, the distinction between impairment and disability seems to be pretty much accepted by everybody. A, an impairment is some condition or some um, part of the body which, um, some feature of the body which um, prevents one from performing some kind of action. Uh, the conventional definition, for instance, of the World Health Organization, which they published about 10 years ago, is that it's an abnormality of the structure of the body that either is congenital or acquired, which basically prevents one from carrying out some kind of action. Um, the more socially uh, conscious people, the social constructivists, would try to avoid using the term abnormality, but simply say that it's a feature of, of the body, lacking a limb, for instance, which has some effect on one's ability to carry out actions. But I think there's fairly good agreement as to what an impairment is. The problem is that people have very different views on what a disability is. Uh, the standard definition, at least the definition of the World Health Organization, until fairly recently, I think they've updated it, um, has been that this is a, according to WHO, a restriction um, of ability to perform an activity in a manner consistent with the range considered to be normal for a human being. Deaf people are absolutely certain they are normal. They reject any suggestion they are not normal, and they would reject this kind of definition of disability. A social constructivist um, philosophers who have a somewhat less um, technological point of view would basically say that this is a due to something, maybe social organization, which prevents people who have some kind of physical impairment for carrying out an action. Um, in other words, um, in a socially constructivist point, from socially constructivist point of view, a disability may arise from the inability of society to allow people who have some impairment, such as lack of hearing, to to function normally, I'm not, or at least to, to carry out certain actions. The problem is that the entire literature, at least that I've read, about cochlear implants, retinal implants, assist to people with disabilities, it seems to take a, a strongly medical point of view. And the, the, the attitude that's expressed, at least in the papers I've read, and I certainly haven't done a, a totally exhaustive survey, is that people, the, the investigators have the attitude that here you have people who are not normal, who are somehow disabled through some um, disease process or accident, and their, their goal in life is to treat these people and let them function normally. And this point of view is one that deaf people have strenuously opposed from, um, for cochlear implants. In fact, deaf people, it turns out, in many cases, um, and I should use the term de the deaf with a capital D because they view themselves as a separate identity, don't view deafness as a disability, but simply as a normal variant of the human condition. People have different sexual preferences, um, have different skin colors. They tend to view themselves as being different in the sense that they have no sense of hearing, but this is just a normal variant in the human condition. Many of these people, of course, were born that way. And moreover, um, the deaf people have come to view deafness as identifying a cultural identity, and um, which to them is, is fully rich and satisfying in its possibilities as other cultural identities are to other groups of, of individuals. This is held together in, in their uh, culture by sign language, which they view as a sophisticated and unique form of communication. And so you can see the problems that could arise when doctors in white coats come along with these little devices to be implanted in young children to cure them of deafness when in many cases the parents wanted to preserve this particular feature of the child. Okay? And this has been the basic root of 
maybe perhaps 30 years of controversy between deaf community and the social implants and, and people who try to get them to use these cochlear implants. And in fact, there's, there's a, a small literature um, from the deaf community, largely come out of Gallaudet University in Washington, which um, takes a, a social constructivist point of view, arguing for the um, deaf community. And at least some of these people point out that, that the deaf should be regarded actually as an ethnic group in our society with their own characteristics. One article by, um, I probably got his name pronounced wrong, Komosarov on the ethics of implanting uh, young children, deaf children with, you know, um, developed a series of criteria by which one might identify what an ethnic group is in the standard kind of arguments that you find in the ethics literature. And the distinctive characteristics are, have a collective name for the group, feeling the community, norms for behavior, a special language, art forms, and so forth. And one could argue that deaf, the deaf community has all of these characteristics. And you can make a, a strong claim that these people should be considered to be their own ethnic group held together by sign language. <coughs> now, this um, initially, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, when these cochlear implants first started appearing, the deaf community had absolutely vehement opposition to the use of, of implants. Um, because basically th they viewed this as a threat to their own cultural identity, particularly when these were implanted in young children who would then not learn how to use sign language. Um, uh, there were many concerns expressed by deaf, the deaf community or their spokesmen that, that um, having an implant at an early age would basically prevent a child or at least delay the, the child's learning how to use sign language, which of course the deaf community regarded as their community's natural language and um, at the same time would never really become fully uh, competent to deal with, with in the world of uh, people with, 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 I won't say normal hearing, but you know what we would consider normal hearing. And this is, again, clearly related to their idea that this would damage their existence as a community. The um, National Association of the Deaf, um, early on, like 20 years ago now, issued a position statement that deplored uh, the FDA's decision to approve implants in children. Um, they um, criticized the manufacturers and doctors as giving very bad advice to uh, parents of deaf children about these things giving overly optimistic um, presentations about how the, the benefits of, of implants. And of course, in those days, the implants were much less competent than they are now. Uh, more recently, the National Association of the Deaf has backed off a bit, undoubtedly recognizing the fact that these devices are here and are being widely used. And uh, they're now um, um, stressing the need to recognize the rights of parents to make informed choices, um, take advantage of the technological possibilities that these devices have, but at the same time, teach the child to uh, learn sign language. It's hard for me, to, before I got involved in reading some of this literature, it was hard for me to understand just how deeply the deaf community felt about this. And in my research for this talk today, I, I, I actually came across um, examples of, of deaf parents selecting children prenatally for deafness because they didn't they wanted to have deaf children who, who grew up as part of their community. Um, there are now learned articles by ethicists arguing for or against whether this is is ethically appropriate or not. Um, there was a famous case of, of of a lesbian couple, both of whom were deaf, selecting a sperm donor to have the greatest chance of having children born of one of them who would be who would be deaf. 
so given this um, the idea that you would have children implanted at an early age with um, implants which would somehow interfere with their desire or ability to learn sign language would be quite a strong, um, a significant problem. And we keep on seeing articles, uh, statements like this in the literature that, you know, the danger is that these kids won't really become good at sign language, won't become part of our culture, but at the same time won't be able to function effectively in, in a hearing context. Whether this actually is happening or not, I don't, don't know. My sense, and I'm not r exactly an expert on this, is that the technology is improving so rapidly that probably these discussions are becoming somewhat moot. As kids are growing up with these implants, the ones that don't lose them, of course, um, and they are found to function quite well. Well, I suspect that a lot of the heat of this argument has um, going away. To make it very blunt, it uh, looks like the deaf community may have lost this battle. But I don't know for sure. We should perhaps talk to someone who's part of the deaf community to find out what the current situation is. I wonder whether similar things may arise with retinal implants. And I don't know. The technology really hasn't been widely used. We're still talking about devices that are in just phase two clinical trials, short-term trials on a handful of people for feasibility studies more than anything else. And it may be 20 years until these devices become widely enough used so that they will significantly impact the population. Um, the only hint I, I, I can find that there may be a problem is that article in the New York Times, which I asked you to read, um, I thought it was quite a nice article, but the author was basically complaining that young children now aren't learning how to use Braille. Um, they're so tied to the MP3s and, and you know the uh, auditory stimuli that they're just not becoming competent with Braille. But the problem is, well, this, well, the problem might be. Suppose you give these people retinal implants, which doesn't provide them with a visual capacity comparable to that of normally sighted people. Will that, at the same time, discourage them even more from using or learning to use Braille, but at, at, while at the same time preventing them from functioning completely um, adequately in a sighted world? And again, I don't know. We don't know what the technology will develop into 20 years from now when these devices start being used um, widely. But I can only guess that there may be similar kinds of issues that are going to arise as arose with the um, deaf community. Um, we can just see it coming. And again, the literature you read in scientific journals takes a very scientific point of view. Doctors are developing devices to treat people who are disabled, visually handicapped. I think they probably don't use the term handicapped anymore. That's no longer politically correct, but that's sort of the attitude they have. And, and I suspect that, that their gifts will maybe receive with somewhat different attitudes by the people who are their intended recipients. But again, I don't know. The other issue that is coming up um, with, which is part of this larger um, health reform in the United States, but it's also being discussed throughout the world, is what we might call distribu distributional justice. Um, basically, society can't afford to cover all the medical needs all the, that, people, that people have, provide all the services. And these devices, the cochlear implants, are fairly expensive. We're talking about 40,000 bucks or so for the device, the procedure, and maybe a year of training to get someone proficient in using them. Um, I um, just reviewed in preparing for this talk a, a um, paper by some Canadian economists technology assessment types, uh, which um, discuss the issue of funding from of these things from a Canadian perspective. And what they pointed out, I apologize, I should have put the author's name down on the, on the footnote, but I didn't. Um, 
what these authors pointed out was that um, the, car, the implants are very expensive, and you're dealing with the people who demand them now form an extremely heterogeneous group, people with all ages, all levels of hearing impairment. Um, um, and there's now sort of a medical push to use implant these in people who aren't totally deaf but may have uh, fairly severe impairment but can still hear. Um, and as well as putting these things in both ears to give them binaural um, hearing. So at $40,000 in a year, you're talking about a fairly large investment in people who may not be completely um, absent of, of hearing ability. And, and since deafness is a rather common problem, many older people become, lose um, a good part of their hearing acuity anyway, potentially the market for these things is quite large. Now, and so the aggregate co cost of this to society will be very hard, large, and it's got to be paid for some way. In Canada, I just found out, um, they face, they deal with this problem by, from a top-down approach. The government simply limits funds that's available for various interventions. The um, and authors of this article who are from British Columbia, Vancouver, um, said that in their whole province, they had enough money for 10 implants in the whole province. Okay, and this was, they said something like one-third uh, on a par per capita basis, the, f the number that was used elsewhere in Canada, and clearly a tiny fraction of the number of people who were demanding these. And so this article actually had two little mini ethics cases. You know, person A who was, you know, young person, totally deaf, unemployed, needed implants to be able to get a job versus person B who had some other condition. And so here these doctors then were basically um, trying to decide, given their 10 implants that they had to dispense this year, who was going to get the, the um, implant. Now, in a rather subtle way, they, they said that, you know, the United States does it differently. We don't impose top-down limits on access to technology. What we do in the United States is simply don't provide any treatment to people who don't have insurance, which is another way of rationing the technology. I meant to look up, um, to find out Medicare's policy about cochlear implants, and I apologize, I um, didn't have a chance to do it. Unfortunately, I don't have 3G internet communication in my car, but um, it might be interesting to find out under what conditions Medicare will provide these services. I'm sure they provide them to people who are covered with Medicare, but you know, the kinds of people who need, need these the most are young people, many of whom come from families that are not certainly not wealthy enough to spend this kind of money and may not have the kind of medical uh, insurance that would provide this. So clearly, these kinds of very expensive devices are going to raise and are raising substantial issues of distributed justice. Um, I could, would guess that retinal implants, when they come on in commercial use, are going to be even more expensive than these because they certainly are going to be much more um, uh, expensive. Um, another question that is sort of a widely discussed one in bioethics these days is the issue of enhancement. Uh, if I take a drug, it makes me perform better on my examination. Um, is it ethical for me to do this at somebody else's expense who may not be taking the drug? Well, at, in what sense are these functional implants enhancement? Um, a fully, a deaf person, a member of the deaf community would surely regard a cochlear implant as a form of enhancement, providing them with competence that they wouldn't normally have. And they are quite happy they've grown up being part of the deaf community, viewing their community as held together with, through mechanisms that don't involve hearing. Uh, is providing a deaf person a sense of hearing through a, an implant a form of enhancement? Well, probably is. Is this something that would carry ethical consequences in this way that we would argue about you or me taking enhancement, drugs for enhancement? I'm pretty sure it would. I'm not sure exactly what kind of ethical issues it would raise, but certainly. Yes, but what about if, if functional implants are enhancement for the deaf, what about retinal implants for the blind?
giving them a sense of a sensation, a, a visual, a, a sensory input which they would not normally have. But then why stop that? this? What about, suppose I want to view infrared light. Suppose I want to be able to have the um, ability to view x-rays, x-ray vision. Suppose I want to be able to have some other sensory ability. Well, why can't we just then pr produce a, an implant to put in me, who has more or less normal hearing and vision, an implant to provide sensory capabilities? We, of course, are enhancing the ability of the rat to feel directional cues by putting an electrode in its brain and triggering the whisker um, sensors. Well, the other issue which sort of comes up in, in these, my review of these three different technologies is something that Eric Racine um, described very forcefully, actually with reference to RoboRat in his lecture at, in Sandia a few years ago. Um, and I have to sort of apologize for taking some of his material, which I think was, is pretty useful in this context. And he, he's an ethicist, but he's really interested in, in the kinds of issues that arise in communication or miscommunication between the scientists, between scientists and people who develop technologies and the public. He did a small, tiny literature search uh, to find what the reaction in, among scientists and in the media was to our story about RoboRat. This is that rat walking around under control. Um, I view RoboRat myself as being a clever but not a very profound development. It doesn't take all that much new technology to stimulate the sensor the centers in the brain that make the rat feel like its whiskers are being tweaked. And it doesn't take an awful lot of sense of, of stimulation, of sophistication to excite the pleasure center in the rat. So this is a, a nice demonstration, but I don't think that most neuroscientists, and again, I'm not one, but I don't think that most neuroscientists would view this as a profound development. Um, this was presented to the public and as turning the rats somehow into robots. Um, in the internet, you can see, uh, you know, heated discussions about interfering with the free will of a rat, whatever that is. Um, and I think the investigators, the people who wrote the, this Robo Rat paper itself, Talwar, Chapman, et al., probably encouraged this to some extent by sort of speculating that, well, maybe we might be able to use this in the future to train rats to go into dangerous environments to carry little cameras with them to, uh, you know, survey dangerous territory. Um, Racine looked at some of the um, media coverage, and he started off with a, an editorial about this article in Nature, which is not exactly yellow journalism. And this was presented to the public in a very sophisticated journal as um, speculating about the using rats for bomb disposal teams. Um, talking about rat bots equipped with satellite positioning tags as smart sensors. Of course, the Defense Department's funding all this work. Um, and as the story of this got sort of amplified through the media wind tunnel, it became more and more pitched to the idea that these rats were somehow being remotely controlled, were robots, and were rat bots. Um, again, it seems to me, as a technician, you know, familiar with technology, this is not a, a really stunning development, but a clever demonstration. Um, but this somehow led to just a whole lot of very heated discussion, which um, I think was sort of off the point, or maybe a very speculative interpretation of what the investigators really did. And I don't see that the investigators tried too hard to dampen this down by clarifying the situation. And if anything, they um, tended to exaggerate it by speculating, probably for the benefit of their Defense Department sponsors, that this may actually have military uses in the future. This was eight years ago. I don't see too many rats, or goldfish for that matter, uh, looking for it. 
uh, buried munitions in Iraq or, or what have you. And uh, Racine went on and, and looked at some of the <coughs> editorials in the media, in the legitimate media that developed. And the, the research, the, the commentary about this project was, or the possibilities of this, was generally pretty neg neg negative. Uh, the silence of the newer engineers for not speaking out about this. Um, um, again, I think this is just grossly overinflated, and uh, but there's speculation of wiring up soldiers' brains to fighting machines and helping improve warfare and what have you. We're not quite there yet. Racine took a couple lessons from this. What he said first, which is probably obvious to philosophers, but maybe not to scientists themselves, is that the public responds to what scientists say, not by listening to what scientists say closely, but this elicits a whole um, you know, bunch of reactions based upon their personal beliefs and, and culture. And this clearly is seen in the story of the cochlear implant, where you had this one group of people, the deaf, who responded very strongly to this from the point of view of their own cultural perspective. And this also um, is seen in Racine's little story of discussion about the robo-rat, where clearly people are responding to the robo-rat far more strongly than would be justified by the rather small technical advancement that actually was. Racine said that scientists tend to look at communication with the public through a top-down approach. Here you have these experts walking around in white coats, talking about truth and beauty. And at least in the scientist's view, the media pick up the true story and, and pass on the truth to the public. Um, but clearly, it doesn't work that way. Um, scientists would tend to say that this is because the media tend to hype up results and, and scientific discoveries. But it may be a fair statement would be that maybe the scientists themselves aren't really communicating as clearly and as forcefully as they could themselves. This is actually directly from Racine's slide. And what he said is if you look at the top-down model of the way scientists, science is communicated, well, you have these scientists in white coats um, presenting absolutely objective knowledge. And, um, but what happens actually is that the <laughs> Oh, don't stop, so please. Okay. Yeah, you, you don't I, I've, I've, got a, I've got a three. I've got about three minutes. Okay. okay. But what he says actually is that the scientific information that's conveyed to the public just elicits all sorts of speculation, interpretation by the public, which um, involves one's people's own own um, attitudes about science. We're talking about a social communication and not just conveying information. Well, so these three little microscopic case studies really sort of illustrate just what Racine is talking about. Clearly, retinal implants are just not value neutral devices, at least to the recipients. They are strongly um, imbued with, with values which they may not share. And obviously, blindness, deafness are not just medical conditions to be treated, but somewhat more complex phenomena, as well as the fact that the media tends to provide a very exaggerated picture of, of the benefits of the technology. Now I shall taper off, sit down, and fall asleep after driving all day. Okay, that's it. That's it.